Welcome everybody. The uh, the GM's still fucking sick and tired of D and D, and just absolutely refuses to play Five E and thinks Jeremy Crawford is the devil. Uh, so sessions canceled while we figure out how to play Daggerheart. Cause goddamn, is that book still a little all over the place in terms of organization? Just throwing that one out there. This is <laughs> not this is not part of the review necessarily, but yeesh. We're back though. Tis I, and tis Isaiah. Yes. Uh, we're back on the old, the old dagger heart talk, and uh, you know, uh, I I don't I don't know I can't think of a I can't think of a, a better uh, synonym per se. I'm gonna put review in the title, but I don't want to make it seem like this is a formal review because we we don't do that here. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we don't do that. But w- w- this is a this is a a post play discussion, if you will. Uh, we're, we're, we have we have played the game after we read it uh, a couple of weeks ago, whatever it was, maybe a month ago, something like that. Uh, and we have now played said game. Uh, I was I was GMing. Isaiah was a player. Obviously, we also had three other players, but they're not here, so they don't matter. We killed them. Uh, 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 yes, actually, uh, they're in the they're in the basement uh, below my house. Anyway, or in the crawl space. I mean, <clears throat> you know. Uh, I know. I, I use noodles to feed Brett. Oh well, yeah, that makes sense. He was looking a little malnourished. Yeah, just a little bit. Oh. Anyway, we're not going to continue down this rabbit hole. Uh, yes, we we have we have played the dagger heart. We will now. Discuss the dagger heart, having played it in a very unprofessional post-play review. But we're gonna that's how we're gonna phrase it, because I can't think of a word other than review. <laughs> Fair enough. Right? I don't know. Um Before we get into all that, take a moment. Say hello to your grandmother. And hit follow or subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice that you are currently listening on. Please. Thank you. Especially if you want more Daggerheart content, because that's all I'm talking about for the rest of my life. I'm kidding. I um, mean, wild, bro. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just become a 100% Daggerheart podcast. Um, yeah, I. We've run out of things to talk about very quickly. <laughs> uh, you say that, that, but there's people whose entire YouTube is. In, whose entire YouTube channel is only D and D, and they still have yet to run out of anything. So, to be fair, D and D's got what fifty years of content and like discussion pieces worth of, of stuff to talk about. Whereas Dagger Hearts got like six months. <laughs> well, I mean, there's people whose entire channel is only five E. So, you know, true. They still and, got ten years. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm just saying, you could get a lot out of a. You could squeeze a lot of juice out of a good enough lemon or whatever the fucking phrase is. The saying, you know, I'm just, I don't know. I don't know what I was trying to say there. I was about to say you could get enough juice out of a grape, but that doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> no, no, not really. Can't really juice a grape. I mean, you can't. There is juice in a grape, but you can't juice a grape. This is dumb. Why am I talking about this? You having a moment, but I. I'm just now thinking about how one would juice a grape. I don't. I mean, the same way you make wine, I guess you just get a bunch of them and start stomping on them. True. Is it juicing, though? I guess it is. Yeah. I guess yeah, it's called juicing grapes. I guess that counts. This isn't important. Anyway. So before we really get into the meat potatoes, we have to do a little bit of bookkeeping stuff just so everybody knows kind of where we're at. Um. So, uh, fun fact, Isaiah, I don't know if you were aware of this or not, but um, Daggerheart version 1.4 dropped literally today as of recording. I did not know that, actually. Yep, dropped straight up today. That's that's uh, that's I why I, that's what I was sharing those updates with in the in the chat earlier today, ah. because 1.4 dropped today. Uh, so we will not be discussing 1.4 because although I was looking over it briefly, I wasn't really giving it a very thorough read. And we didn't play one point with the 1.4 rules, so we're not going to be talking about it. That being said, looking over the 1.4 rules briefly, not a lot of big shakeup changes. 
very much a, a, a bookkeeping pass, if you will. So there's, we're not really missing that much anyway. Mm. Uh, so this discussion will technically be about 1.2 and 1.3 because we played one session under the 1.2 rules and then our second session, the 1.3 rules had dropped. So we played with those. Uh, so we played a little bit of 1.2 and then one session, 1.2, three sessions of 1.3. Uh, we did four sessions in total. Um, we played the 1.2 version of the quick start adventure because for some reason, the quick start advent, the, the 1.3 update for the main rules, the quick start did not get updated at the same time. So the 1.3 update for the quick start adventure was behind the rules update. I don't know why it was a little annoying. Either way, point being, we did not play the 1.3 version of the quick start. We played the 1.2. Uh, that was our first two sessions. And then after those two sessions of the quick start adventure, we then did two sessions post adventure, which was just me doing my own little, you know, quick. Basically, I just built off the back end of the adventure and came up with some ideas and made my own little quick homebrew thing, you know, as you do. <laughs> um, uh, that being said much like I was just saying with the 1.4 rules the 1.3 version of the quick start adventure not super different from the original 1.2 version just a lot of small adjustments so again nothing big missing uh, we had yeah, it seems like just on the face of it it was a lot of balancing stuff counters, it was yes like enemy stats and shit like that uh most yeah the updates have not been anything crazy upending flip the table yet i have a feeling that will come eventually but it hasn't happened yet um we did and then so we did two sessions where the players were level one and then we had two sessions of the players at level two so we had two sessions in the tier zero range and then technically two sessions in the tier one range although the very very beginning of the tier one range obviously uh, as a reminder, the tiers level one is tier zero. I still hate that level two to five is tier one and then five to seven. I'm going to open up the PDF right now because I this isn't I can't I'm talking about my ass here. I'm trying <laughs> to remember this. Uh, please hold while I scroll. OK. Two, I was wrong. Two to four is tier one. Five to seven is tier two. And then eight to ten is tier three. Um, so technically tier zero is only one level. I don't. I don't really understand the decision there. I'm going to be honest. It's kind of annoying, especially because the game has quite an abundance of tier zero enemies. But you're you're not going to be playing tier zero for lit very long because much like D and D five e they tell you not to stay at level one for very long, so that was an odd choice. Uh, but here we are. Also, please, for the love of God, stop making level zero and tier zero and stop putting zero in there. Just start from one. What's the difference? Just go one to four. I don't understand. Uh, so I would I would agree with you. I would have agreed with you up until like three months ago, and now I'm actually on the other side. Why? Uh, because Lancer has a tier zero equivalent, and yeah, but you literally can't have Lancer you, without tier zero. But you can. You could just make it one to thirteen. There's no difference. I know what you're talking about. There's no difference. Just make it one to thirteen. People just don't like the number thirteen. But you could make it one to thirteen easily. Why does it have to be zero? I suppose, yeah. Doesn't make any sense. It's more, I guess it's less that it needs to be zero and more that I don't see a reason to change it. It, it kind of works narratively and structurally. Sure, you, you don't need to necessarily change it. I just I just hate that we that this is a thing we do now. Like this is like because like the phrase session zero makes sense to me because the idea of session zero, it's a zero because you're not actually playing the game. You're just sort of getting ready to play the game. You're not playing. So it makes sense to call that session zero. But level one in Daggerheart, why is it tier zero? What, what is the point of doing that? You know what I mean? 
Um, I'm, I wonder if, if it's a if it's some sort of response to the idea that like most campaigns like you know D and D starts at level one, but your character is not a like basic goob even at level one. Like level one assume the fact that they have a player level assumes that they are like at least somewhat cool. You know, like graduated yeah. college is a veteran soldier. So maybe the idea for these games is to set you back to zero as a sort of response to that. But that's not the case, because I would argue in Daggerheart, you're more you're even more of a cool guy than you are in 5e from the start. Because it's more heroic. Are fantasy. you? I, I feel like you are. Yeah, I feel like your character starts off more powerful with more options than you would relatively like comparatively to a 5e level one character. Oh, I don't see that at all. No, especially with something like a, like the wizard in Daggerheart has way less options than a fucking. They have less spells, IV but the one. game has less spells across the board. But the wizard is still the class with the most spells that anyone can have. Like they have less spells because of how the game is designed, but not because the wizard is like a goober in Daggerheart. It's just because of how the car, the, the domain cards work. Yeah, I'm not saying the wizard's a goober, but it, it like D- Daggerheart is weird. It, you have, you know, because they're trying to, to zone in on that that apocalypse world style sort of fiction over uh, fiction over rules. You have less codified things that you can do. I've re- I feel like there's more things you can do overall, but less of it is like written down. A lot more of it is sort of intuitive. Right. Sure. But even just. I still think even your codified stuff, you have you have abilities like the domain cards and the stuff you get from like your ancestry and your background and stuff, I feel like are more influential abilities than a level one 5e character has. Like you can do kind of like a cooler, more more over the top thing like the rogue. The rogues like shadow stepper ability. There's no level one D&D rogue that can like teleport into the shadows. You know what I mean? Like you have more over the top fantasy stuff, like higher fantasy stuff at at level one. Like a rogue teleporting into a shadows is the th- is a thing a, D- a a rogue gets to that point in five e eventually, but you don't start that way at level one. Whereas a dagger heart rogue literally starts that way. No, you don't. But that that's just sort of given that you get your subclass at level one, so they can justify giving you more things at level one. Sure, but that's what I'm saying is you have more things at level one, like you have more over the top abilities at level one relative to a 5e character. I mean, you can't compare it one to one for obvious reasons because the two systems are not close enough together to really compare. But in terms of a game feel, I feel like Daggerheart characters start as more heroic than 5e characters do. And then narratively, the game describes them as being more heroic than 5e characters I mean, shit, the quick start adventure, you're literally the first thing you're doing as a level one character is on a mission for the king, which is like not level one dirt farmer type stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, I suppose. There's also a lot more implied history with Daggerheart characters because of the background questions. Now, granted, you don't have to do those. You can ignore them. But there is an implied thing of like more history, I feel like, than... Uh, or more more adventurer ish, more adventury history that a Daggerheart character starts with relative to a 5e character. Like a 5e character, I feel like the fictional idea is a 5e character is like, I used to be a guy in the military, and then, you know, in the last year or so, I became a fighter or something like that. Whereas I feel like. The implication with a dagger heart character is I've been a fighter for like a couple of years now or a warrior in the case of dagger heart. You know what I mean? Like, I think the, they start a little bit above just by nature of the tone of the game, because I think the tone of the game is more heroic. Five E's tries to do that thing where it's like, we're going to, you know, and we've both complained about this where 5e is like, we're going to pretend like we're not heroic fantasy, but also we kind of are heroic fantasy. But like the game can do both because at low level, it's not heroic. And then at high level, it is. But like, you know, it doesn't walk that line very well. Whereas I yeah. think Daggerheart isn't. Uh, I'm like Daggerheart isn't um, isn't trying to walk that line. Daggerheart is being more explicit, like 
these are heroic characters. We're assuming sort of heroic. Yeah. Well, Avatar so, the Last Airbender esque shenanigans. Well, so I was going to say, I, I feel like Daggerheart has a bit of the opposite problem where Daggerheart says like, oh, yeah, we're big heroic fantasy, but it doesn't feel like it at times for me. Uh, By way of what? Uh, The rules, I feel, do not reflect it being heroic fantasy. Such as? Because I, pl- like, I feel like things like hope, the the ability to use stress to like overcome problems, those feel like heroic fantasy-esque abilities. I feel like the domain cards you get are much more over-the-top heroic powers that you start with relative again the like teleporting into shadows or the ability to like rain magical daggers at level one as a rogue uh just given from the fact that like your characters are a lot squishier on average like we to be fair we didn't have a sentinel or any of like the really chunky classes that when we played we we had had a warrior and well yeah so we had we had a I guess we probably mentioned we had a human warrior, a human wizard, a furball granger, and a fairy rogue. Um, warrior is chunkier, but I think I think I mean I I felt like Sam's warrior character was definitely a lot more durable than the than the rest of you were. Like he definitely took less damage. I mean, well, the ranger character took the least damage by virtue of just not being in the way of the attacks. But like in terms of people who are getting wailed on, I definitely feel like the warrior was quite a bit more durable. But- yes, but I, I think the thing for me is because everyone has the same hit points at the end of the day, right? Everyone has six unless you you know do the level up to get more. Um, right. Yeah. You all have the same at the start at the beginning or more or less. And it's yeah. And it's, uh, you know, the whole threshold thing. Uh, no matter what, unless you reduce the damage to below one, which is just not going to happen reliably, especially at low level in Daggerheart, you can only be hit six times. Where in, in a rogue can also only be hit six times at minimum. You know yes. what I mean? So at the end of the day, you, to me at least, it didn't feel like, like Sam took more hits because he had like you know he had higher armor and the shield and shit he had higher the shield the, the like the like yeah the flourish thing that he had but he was still eating quite a lot of damage and consistently being like hey guys i'm at like 2 hp like what do i do um i mean yeah like he's getting hit i mean yeah there's there is it is very hard to be if yes if you're getting hit you're taking the damage and you know, maybe evasion scores need to get a little bumped relative to like attack or or maybe enemy attack bonuses need to get a little lowered or something like that's number noodly stuff. But character durability is not the only measurement of are the characters like heroic characters. Like, I think you're narrowing your scope and focusing on this one particular thing of the characters feel a little squishy, but you have all this other stuff going on around that. Well, it's not the only thing. Um, like I just and I I said this earlier and I I stick with this. We don't need two two resources to manage. I don't really what, see a point of having. Hope? Yeah, I just don't see a point of having two of them. Um, uh, I, because I, you get some classes that use a shit ton of one and none of the other, and vice versa. Well, I whereas under- I feel like you should have a balance of both, pretty much across the board, just in different places. Well, no, I don't I don't know if I agree with that. I think the idea that some classes use one resource more than the other is not inherently a problem. The thing that gets a little. So, like, I, I understand the benefit of having two different resources is that you can have some granularity in the cost of a thing. So, like, for example, if you only had hope and every ability cost hope, you would be burning out on hope really, really often, and you might not be getting it back as often. But because you have hope and stress, and stress is arguably the sort of less valuable resource, then abilities that are slightly less impactful can use a slightly less valuable resource. 
to give like a 5e comparison you know uh if everything utilized spell slots then some abilities that are not as impactful it would feel weird that you would have to spend like higher level spell slots to use a thing that's not as effective for example if, if barbarian rage for some reason you spell slots you know it's like you'd be it's like all right let me spend my fifth level slot to like rage again as opposed to it being its own little ammo thing so there's a there's a benefit to having two different resources the i think the problem just comes in in that well one i think they're still trying to tweak the uh like how valuable one is versus the other right and and that's something you get through play testing is the valuableness of of resource X versus resource Y and how much should they cost, yada, yada, yada. But I think the other problem is just the two replenish at sort of different paces and in sort of weird different ways. So it's hard to gauge is this worth the stress? Is this worth a hope? Should this be a hope or a stress instead? Like, I think they just need to be looked at. I don't know if they necessarily need to throw out having both. You could potentially use just hope as the resource for everything. But then you go, okay, do the players need to get hope more often? Right? Because I feel like right now, if hope was the only resource to use on like if all your abilities, like all domain cards that required you to spend some kind of resource all came from hope. I don't feel like you're getting hope back reliably enough for that to be justified. So then you go, OK, do players need to get hope more often? But if they're getting hope more often, does it feel less impactful? Maybe. Maybe the problem is that hope needs to feel more impactful. Maybe that's honestly the problem. no. Like, for me, I do, like I think Star Wars and ironically Lancer just did it like the th- you have more points of the thing that that you can recoup and you can recoup that thing and the big things you can't like, you know, I mean, and that's not even true. The light side points you can recoup every time the, the, the you can recoup them. Yeah, the GM uses one and you get one back and vice versa. If I I would just prefer a system where you can gain and lose stress, yeah. It's like like you know consistently, it's sort of a game to balance it. Uh, in the same way that you do at Lancer, right, where you have your heat gauge for your mech, and you want like, you can have builds that have no heat and builds that sort of exist on the borderline. And the, like the game, the name of the game there is is keeping those numbers consistent. I would prefer that more than right, but that's what I'm saying. Having stress which you can't get back reliably well, and you, then being like, oh, can. cool. Through potions, but there's no like ability no, that says resting. you just clear stress. Potions and short resting. Yeah, I guess like. And some characters have a, like Furbolgs have the ability to potentially ignore stress. It's a chance, obviously, it's not like a, it's not a replenishment, but it's a chance to ignore stress. So you can, I, th- I, I, I think maybe the issue is is that hope. I think hope maybe doesn't feel impactful enough is part of the problem. Like you use hope for a whole bunch of things, whereas I almost want it to be you have a bigger stress track and a smaller hope track. But when you use hope, it's a big deal. So like most of your abilities, you stress and then you do some some you know, one of your bigger, more powerful abilities, or maybe some form of like upcasting or something uses hope. Like I think hope the the two feel about equal value. And that's where I think it feels weird because stress is like your character's general sort of stamina side note. I put it in the notes here. I, I feel like stress should just be called stamina. That's just me. No, I agree. I, right? it, it, stress it, feels like feel the wrong heroic. word. It, yeah, yeah, stress feels like the wrong word. I think it should just be called stamina because that's really what it is. You're you're burning your energy to do specific things or you're burning your energy to like 
tank a hit or like you're burning your stamina to do something like for example i didn't do it very often but like you know one of the one of the punishments for getting a partial success on a roll could be marking stress it feels like that should just be saying oh you just burn some of your stamina like you don't quite you know you roll to climb the cliff face and you get a success with fit with fear okay you climb the cliff face but it was harder than you expected so you take a you know you lose a point of stamina like stress feels like the wrong word but anyway well that also feels weird to me like and they they sort of did away with that in 1.3 which i was appreciative um uh, did away with what the like you fail the roll you gain a stress no they didn't or what was the oh no that was the damage if you take that was like, damage you don't, that was if yeah, you yeah, go below your minor stress threshold you take stress damage which that yeah that's, real quick the whole like failing a roll gives you stress. Kind of, it bugs me in the same way because it is much harder to regain stress and a lot of abilities that I feel like shouldn't be uh, dependent on stress are like to, like to hide. Right, but again, that just comes down to, I think you're getting a little too nitpicky there because that just comes down to adjusting the math and doing a bunch of play testing to get it to feel right. You know what I mean? Like, I, yes, I, it's weird that you have to spend stress to hide. I agree. That's a weird one. And like the idea of going below your minor threshold. Yeah, that I get what they were doing with the minor threshold one, because it's like, oh, because there's a, there's a lot of other tabletop games where the idea is like you have a HP track and then you have a sort of smaller, less significant HP track, which actually I think Star Wars did that, didn't it? Didn't Star Wars have something like that? Yeah, well, yeah, you had, yeah, yeah, you had HP and you had wounds. No, no, you had wounds and then critical uh, critical hits or whatever, critical injuries. Um, so it's like bigger. Oh, sort of, yeah. I, I I was thinking about like, you know, uh, like using force abilities caused strain. That wasn't. I don't. Maybe I don't, I don't remember that well enough how that works. Point being, the idea of having like a an HP track that is less significant and an HP track that is more significant is a thing other games have done. But as you pointed out, you can't uh, stress right now. Isn't something that you could sort of as easily get back. So it doesn't feel like a less significant track. It feels like an equally, it feels just as valuable as HP and hope. And I think that's the problem is that they all feel like this kind of weird equal amount of valuable. Like stress should be the least valuable resource. It should go up and down. It should shift around the most, right? And I feel like hope should move up and down less. So we're kind of saying the same thing in different words. I maybe I don't I don't know that. No, maybe I don't yeah. know. Because what I was I, saying is, I want it, if if you like, I want things to sort of exist similarly to similarly to the way that they do with Star Wars, which is basically that your strain goes up and down; it fluctuates. You can actively do things that aren't limited to like one or two specific classes, or you know whatever. Like the, every class has a reliable way of reducing strain. And then the big thing, the ho- like hope or in Lancer, the the core system points. Those are big things that you don't get back as easily, but they are big, big things. Uh, yes. Let, let me let me re- let me let so, me rephrase my original thesis. I want one major resource. I only want one major resource. Right now we have two. I'm fine with there being other ones, right? Like you know, fighters have fucking their maneuver points or whatever. But that's a minor resource versus spell slots, which are a major resource. You know. There are yes. So you're saying the problem is the two resources, at least at the moment, feel like they are of equal value, and that feels weird because it feels kind of random. As in, like when you look at a card, when you look at an ability, there's no way to know if it's going to cost hope or stress. It kind of seems random which ones they decided cost what. Is that what you're saying, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much, yeah. Yes. So yes, that 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 yeah. I mean that I see as the problem. 
I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I don't know necessarily. Maybe the maybe maybe it should just all be based off hope. Maybe just toss stress out. Yeah, I mean I've talked about that before as well. Maybe I don't know. Like I, that feels weird, but maybe that's the move. And then the way you the way you, yeah, I guess probably maybe the move should be. Everything's based around hope, and the way you dictate the value is just how much hope something costs. Because right now, most abilities that you'd get for, like, your domain cards and stuff cost one hope generally, sometimes two. So maybe just in maybe just make hope a little more granular and throw stress out and just use hope as that. But then you still have the question of the, the pace at which you regain it. I don't know. Yeah. You'd have speaking to really the, the play with the point. math. Yeah, speaking of the point economy, is it me or was there no ability that we saw that required more than one hope that was worth more than one hope? Um, I, didn't, I didn't feel like there were any that felt worth it. Like the ro- the, the fairies, like Luckbender one, which I hate that name. Um, it's like, oh yeah, you burn, was it like two or three hope to let someone reroll once a session? Yeah. Like, how the fuck is that worth it? <laughs> well, I mean, a reroll is strong. Like, just in general. But, you know, is it three hope strong? I I don't know. Hard to say. I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily know that I've spent I don't know if I that I could say I've played the game enough to really make a judgment call on the individual value, like the costs of things, because it takes a long it takes a long time to really intuitively understand the variance in value of abilities and stuff within a game. You know what I mean? So hard to say. Does the I mean, in terms of like the sniff test, does Luckbender costing three hope feel a little much? Kinda, yes, especially because it's limited to once per session. So it has essentially it has two limitations, which feels a little like unnecessary. So maybe it should just be one hope. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I that's another one where it's like I think you have to you. I feel like a lot of Daggerheart is not a lot of it, but there are there are aspects of Daggerheart that are like cover your ass writing. It's like, oh, hey, we're, we're going to like put all these stipulations on us so people can't break it. It's like, well, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I see why you did that. But did you take into account I, what happens when you do that? I will say like with, in, with Luckbender in particular, I, I, I feel like it, a pretty easy fix for that one is just say once per long rest i i I think (laughs) the once per session thing is fine i I like that i like but it has to be big it's once per session like well i mean once per session you can as the ability is now i'm saying where it lets you do a re-roll for anybody that feels like you could make it once per long rest because it is worth pointing out that it's not just for you anyone who is within close range of you you can re-roll for them so that does make it more valuable because it's a team-wide thing yeah, I think I would prefer a once per session automatic success. Like make it like a sure. make it like a reaction roll. So it's an automatic success. Uh, it generates no hope or fear. It just succeeds. Sure, you could do that. It's an option. I mean, you know, I don't know. The only I will say the the team attack kind of felt worth the three hope, I think. That did, yes. Because you essentially have, like, double advantage, (laughs) you know, like that one. So that one feels pretty worth it. Although I do think there should be some kind of rule in the team attack about how to. uh, Because a lot of the team attacks, it feels like the damage should go up, right? Like Sam and Matt did their fucking whirling blades maneuver. And then but the damage wasn't very good because it was just from Matt's like short sword attack. So mm-hmm. it feels like there should be some kind of rule about how you can combine damage a little bit with the team attack, but the overall combining of the two roles and picking the better one feels pretty worth it. 
So yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. Hard to say. I will say uh, I know the Reign of Blades ability cost two hope. That one, arguably not worth. <laughs> literally didn't use it a single time i know you did yeah well so i didn't use it a single time because that leads into another thing that i kind of you were spending hope on sneak attacks yeah well and and it's not even like because it's it's i was burning hope on sneak attacks but that ability you cannot sneak attack with yeah um and you not only can you not sneak attack with it it goes off of a different stat than you know the the what the game recommends for a rogue which is a rapier or sorry the daggers i guess but like the rapier is like this it's like a a quintessential thing and it gives you plus one to presence and all this shit and you're like it just felt like the the stat array is being spread a little thin at least with rogue for me uh i kind of was hoping that dagger heart would have like you can choose what stat you want to use for your modifier, like give it a range. So like, so yeah, you know, your, rogue, your, you spell can use. Casting, your spell casting trait for rogue is finesse. Finesse. Yeah. So I would say let, like, let it, let someone choose between finesse and presence, you know, like the two quintessential abilities you're going to need for rogue. Cause if you want to play uh, like a super lock picky, you know, roguish rogue, then you're going to be fine. But if you want to play, the smooth talker sword slinger you're you just don't really have a reason to use it but you don't really get any benefits for picking the the sort of swashbuckler rogue you get a bunch of them for picking the sneaky sneak man rogue you know what i mean sure right so fin- yeah finesse the, like, is like there over- is one the meta option is and there's valued a- yeah yeah i mean all the classes have one spell casting trait like you don't get to pick for any of them um, so that that is yeah, that's potentially a thing that could be that that's again getting kind of like more nitpicky. But I mean, I guess you were the you were the one playing the rogue, so I guess you know, fair. Um, side note: speaking, of, this is not necessary. I don't know, maybe this is important. I, I did notice uh, just randomly when I was reading through and, and refreshing on sessions and stuff. There's no monk class or like punchy guy thing. Nope. That feels weird. Feels 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 out of place that there's not like it doesn't necessarily have to be monk, but give me like unarmed fighty guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that that they're going to implement that later because hopefully like you, you know, there's there's a lot of critical role in Daggerheart. I feel like not putting respect on Bo's name as you <laughs> sure. know, the, the pop pop puncher. Like, what are you doing there? Um, I meant to ask this earlier on, but you just started ranting and raving. Um, <laughs> uh, do that, yeah. How so? Like after playing, this was supposed to be the opening question. After playing it versus when you initially read it, do you feel like you are uh, more or less into it after? Like, so you you had the initial read through, you had one opinion, you've played it now. Is the opinion in the same place better or worse? Pretty much in the same place. Like yeah, there okay. was stuff that when I read it, I really liked and that stuff worked out the way that I thought it would for the most part. Like there were some things where I was like, mm. uh, like for the stuff that I don't like about Rogue, Rogue is a lot of fun to play. Okay. Um, if you really take advantage of the fact that you have a lot of control over the narrative, Rogue is fantastic. Sure. Um, yeah. But you do have that thing where it's like, oh, I kind of want to play a cool, like, swashbuckly man. Oh, but, like... You have to play bard. I'm, yeah, I, I I just don't have a reason to use a lot of the finesse-based stuff, because that's not what I wanted to play. If you're um, going to play swashbuckly man, you basically have to play bard, yeah. Yeah. Um, not a huge fan of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, D&D also kind of has that problem, though, right? Like, dex is overvalued and stuff like that, it, so, you it know. absolutely is. I'm not even going to pretend <laughs> that that's not the case. Oh, another thing that I was, like... I had this I had this thought um, with hope, right, where I was like, if you just kind of don't roll amazing, you're just not effective for the like the session. There's just a lot you are not going to be able to pull off. Yeah, but that was right. Like Matt and Sam were getting fucked. I mean, yeah, but like that's true of D&D, too. You know, if you just have a bad 
succession of rolls and you just keep failing and getting, you know, just keep rolling like shit. You know, that's kind of true there, too. Like, that's just I, I don't I don't think there's any avoiding that problem. I think that's just tabletop games. I think it just manifests in different ways and different systems. You know, you could have a session at D&D where your D20 never rolls above a fucking 10. You know what I mean? True, but that doesn't actively lock you out of using your character abilities. Uh, right? If doesn't... I'm a wizard, I can, no matter what, I still have press the digitation and fucking uh, uh, magic missile. You know what I mean? Like, like I can do cool little tricky spells and I can blast shit if I need to. Sure. I but mean, if you just don't have any fucking hope. You're just fucked. You're not fucked. I think you're over exaggerating a little bit there. You're not you're not completely useless. You can still because you can you could roll with fear, but, you know, you could be rolling fear often, but still succeeding your checks and getting to do shit. It's not like a situation where you're, you know, just because you don't have hope, you like have to sit there with your thumb up your ass or anything like that. You know what I mean? Like you can still do stuff. And for it with the wizard example, most of the wizards abilities don't like a lot there's plenty of wizard spells that don't require hope to to use them you just make a spell cast roll you know what i mean like it's not like all of them it's not like every spell you're casting requires hope or some of them will have you can do this or you could spend hope to make it better type stuff like it's not uh like y- yes if you roll poorly and don't get hope you will like you can't use certain abilities that you have, and that can be kind of frustrating. But you're not like, you're not like completely inept. I can do nothing type position. You know what I mean? I didn't see. I didn't see any scenario when we were playing where it was like, you guys can do absolutely nothing in response. You know what I mean? Um, no, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a situation where uh, maybe I, uh, yes, I oversaid. I, you, you know, you're not useless, but you definitely feel gimped if you aren't rolling consistent hope. Yeah, but again, I think that's the same thing of just you're had a, having a bad session of D&D and you're not rolling well, you feel like you're useless, you know? Like, I don't think that's unique to this game. And honestly, because of the way well, I don't know. Hmm. I'd have to think about the math. I was going to say because of the way rolling works, you're often making forward progress, but I don't hard to say how, with like I, so the thing that's kind of weird. So the thing that's kind of funny about the the, um, the dice mechanics with Daggerheart is that you have the whole full success, partial success, failure system, but you have a moving DC which a lot of games that have a a degrees of success system, the DC doesn't move. Like it, like in Apocalypse World, it's always the same DC, which is to say, if you get a seven to nine, it's partial. If you get a ten plus, it's success. If you get a six below, it's a failure. That never changes. But with Daggerheart, you can uh, the, the the GM picks the DC, so that can change. That's kind of a... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sort of on two minds of it. I feel like... I, I didn't the think DC about that remains consistent. Before. <laughs> yeah, if the DC remains consistent, I think you, you, you are better having higher levels of swing because, you know, if the DC, it, it, you know... Like Lancer, if the DC is always 10, it doesn't really matter if you're rolling, you know, 2d10 plus 3 because the two like the the plus three is just sort of there to bolster you where the 2d6 or the the, the 2d10 or whatever what is really what matters right versus a game like D where you have where you way more rely upon your modifiers than your dice rolls after pretty early on in the game to really carry you through those things and the dice is really just supporting whatever you have right like uh, at, at higher levels um you I- have a plus three to attack and then the d20s to get you to that 25. You just need a plus 10 to whatever you're rolling in the die. That's what the die is for. Yeah, but like, uh, no, no. <laughs> I, I think you're I think you're misunderstanding uh, because it's actually the opposite in in a game where the DC is set. 
the bonus is actually of a higher value than in a game like D&D, right? The whole thing with Apocalypse World is if you have a plus three in an ability, your chance of failure is very, very low because you're rolling 2d6 plus three. So the lowest number you could possibly get is a five. And that's the only way you can fail is if you roll two ones on 2d6, which is quite unlikely. So you're, if you have a plus three in Apocalypse World, your chance of at least getting a medium success is incredibly high. You're almost never going to fail on something that you're rolling a plus three with. So if if you were whereas in something like D&D, even if you have a very high bonus, the GM can still hit, set the, Z, the DC out of your reach. You could have a plus 10 bonus, but if the DC is 35, that's still quite hard to get. So it's it's the other way around. Sort of. I mean, I'm going under the assumption that you have a maximum DC in D&D, which you do. It's 30. You technically uh, do. I think it's 35. But yes, you technically do. Um, I mean, as far as I'm aware, it, even before the 2024 rule books, it's, it's always been 30. They were like, if it's above 30, then you just can't do it. Yes, um, you, you have a so maximum have a DC 10, of sorts. But it's still at the end of the day, if you have a DC that literally never moves... That number, that flat number bonus is of a higher value no matter what. It just is because it's a flat, it's a guaranteed amount and your target number never shifts. So it, 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 it just inherently has more value. I suppose it just, it's never felt that way. For me. It always I mean, felt like I, in the game. Like listen, th- I. This is one of those I mean, things. You, yeah, no, uh, mathematically, sure, I can be wrong. But yeah, you got to throw the feelings like, out. <laughs> no, I don't think you can. I, I think it, especially when it comes to a game that relies a lot about like upon how the player feels to do a thing, right? Like if using your battle master maneuvers as a, a fighter don't feel good, you're not going to want to use them as much. Right. I think that's 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 just as important, if not more than the actual math of the thing. I understand. But when you're when you're when the math is what it is and you're misinterpreting it like there's nothing the game can do about that necessarily you know it can adjust in other places but the math is the way it is and if the math is working you know and again Daggerheart is not this because Daggerheart does have a shifting DC which is what I think maybe they could they should consider a static DC I I don't know it's kind of hard to say because having a partial success system although the partial success isn't actually based on the dc at all so i guess it doesn't necessarily because like it's weird because your chance of full success adjust based on the dc but your chance of success at a cost or failure at a boon doesn't adjust because that's not based on the number that's just based on whichever die is higher which is not affected by the dc so you kind of have to i don't know what the math on that would looks like but you have two separate variables moving independently of each other i don't even remember how we got to this point the hell were we talking about that got us here i've lost the thread now uh, how I felt about playing the game after reading it. Right, no, I know, but you said something more specific that... Oh, because you were talking about if you don't roll hope, you're, like, kind of useless. I Again, not useless, just less effective. You're less effective, yes. You're less effective. I mean, you are you are less effective in that you can't use certain abilities, but I don't think that's necessarily inherently a problem with the game. I think that's just a problem anytime you're going to use a randomized number uh, like resolution system. Because like that's just a problem with how tabletop works or not even a problem. That's just a, a thing that is it just is with how tabletop works. Whether you consider it a problem or not is sort of a, a personal opinion thing. But the idea of I am rolling badly everything sucks is like when you when you put in random number generation that's just what's going to happen i don't think you could really avoid that although there are games that don't use rolling dice so i guess those games can avoid it the way you would avoid it is is giving at least in daggerheart's case 
And I don't know how you could even do it. I don't think you could on some level, but what you would need, right, is if you have just a certain amount of hope to start with every session. Uh, and I don't think you should do this particularly. So I, like I said, I don't really know what the answer is because at least at the start of a session, you have the abilities that you can do. You know, you don't have to roll to see if you get your spell slots in the first place as a cleric, right? You just have right. them and then you use them. I think that's kind of what some of I think that's why certain classes have abilities like that, that the warrior giving you a compliment to give you three hope type thing. I think that's why those exist. So you can have a guaranteed hope generator of some kind. You know, they're sure I, I but I wouldn't attach that to a class because then you start getting into conversations about sure. meta and there like, is what is the best. Yeah, there is a guaranteed way to generate hope and it's on a rest. Because you can prepare on a rest and that generates guaranteed one point of hope. So or two points, actually, I think. Um, oh, no, one point if, if you're you said- alone, two points if you prepare with somebody else. So there is at least one way to guaranteed give yourself hope. Now, it's tied to a rest, so maybe not the most elegant way for it to, to do it, but it is it does exist. And that's not, you know, class specific or anything. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, yes, that is true. You do have that. I just don't feel like it's. Um, I mean, you know, maybe I, I, I shit. I mean, maybe you should just start every session with one hope. Like maybe that's an easy fix. I, I don't know. That might be worth it. Yeah, no, I wouldn't hate that. Um, this one hope isn't that like that. It, it's not so much that it's going to be like you start every session beefed up, but you know, or maybe no. I mean, would it? Although, actually, no, because now that with the one point four rules, you the way initiative uh, advantage works is different. Because I was going to say you could use that hope to generate another hope. You know, if you crit. Which you will have, which you used to have a higher chance of doing when you got advantage. Well, you, you could generate two you, hope. You couldn't spend hope to give yourself advantage. That wasn't a thing. Yeah, you did. You 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 spent hope. Oh no 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 no! Oh. My bad. I was thinking about the experience. I keep forgetting nope. that those don't give you advantage. They'll just give you a static. You they know, give you a number modifier. Yes. So yeah, no, you couldn't do that. Um. Probably on purpose. They probably don't want you using hope to generate hope. That's probably a thing they're trying to avoid. Mm. Um, which may be why they adjusted how Vantage works. I don't know. Um, yeah. So, oh, side note, this is kind of a small thing. I feel like HP and stress should go down instead of up. Feels weird they go up. Yeah, yeah, ticking up is kind of strange. I can see that. Right? I don't know. I just was like, I don't like that these go up. <laughs> like, it doesn't... At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, but it's like a mouthfeel thing. It, it feels weird that they go down, to, or that they go up to me for some reason. Which is funny, because it doesn't feel weird in Apocalypse World, but your HP ticks up in Apocalypse World also. Which is why I... Which is probably where they got it from. But it... Your HP also ticks up in Blades, but it doesn't bother me in those games. I don't know why it bothers me in this game, but it kind of does. No, it, 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 no, I, I got a little, I, I thought that was a little weird in Blades, I'm not gonna lie. It doesn't bother me in Blades. Um, well, probably because the way it's fictionally described is different. I think that's probably what it is, because in Blades, it's described as wounds you're taking, like it's harm you're taking, so you take more harm, like you get point, you get in more injuries, so it goes up. Same thing in Apocalypse World. It's described as like wounds you're taking. Whereas Daggerheart uses the, the specifically the phrase hit points, which always feel like a thing that should start and then go down because it's a number of spots that are taking hits, you know, so you have less areas to take hits because the phrase hit points technically comes from battleships, right? Maybe it's yeah. just maybe how it's described. If they called it wounds, maybe I wouldn't care. I don't know. I, I, well, actually, I guess I guess stress going up makes sense. But also, if it was called stamina, then I think it would probably go should go down. 
the, the, the verbiage matters. It doesn't feel like it matters, but it does. No, it does. 100%. <laughs> um, speaking of experiences, since you mentioned them, uh, as a GM, I don't slash didn't interact with those a ton. Um, monsters or adversaries do have experiences on their sheets, but they're obviously, you know, kind of niche to what the adversary is doing. So they didn't come up really. Uh, but like on the player side, are you cool with experiences? Do you feel like they need to be worked, reworked or something? Like what's the vibe on that? Ugh. Ugh, sorry. Um, I like them a lot. I just don't like that they're tied to hope. <laughs> I was just about to say, I don't feel like they should cost hope. That feels weird to me. Yeah, it's I like, oh, well, it's like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I, as a master lock picker, this should be easy for me. Nah, but I feel kind of bummed today. I don't think I'm going to do it right. Like, yeah, yeah. I feel like they should be automatic bonuses. Yeah. Almost or something. I, I honestly think I, I like the, the way if you could do it in a way similar to how Blades does like exp gain you go oh well i'm you know you know my character is an assassin so i'm going to use my assassin skills to try to like like pick this lock right to break and enter and then the players go yeah that makes sense like i could see you doing that versus you being like well you know as a wizard i went to school and i studied the human anatomy which means i can use my muscles to their maximum extent which lets me like you know lift a boulder and you're like that's not how that works bud sorry I don't I I, yeah. I I I literally don't understand what you just tried to describe. What, how it works in blade? What? So the way that you get like you gain XP in blades, right? You go, oh well, I think I feel like I proc this, this, and this, and the party either agrees or disagrees. Right. Do that for proccing your experiences in Daggerheart. Oh well, that's yeah. I I mean, okay, that's a more complicated way to just say what I was saying, where they should just be automatic. Which is to say, like, GM, could I reasonably use this experience to apply to this role? Yes, I think that makes sense. Go ahead, apply it. Like, yeah. You just said a more long-winded version of what I was saying. <laughs> but yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that's probably fine. I, I will say one thing that feels a little weird about the experiences thing. So, like, Matt's character had the experience Monster Hunter, right? So it's like, oh, if I'm tracking because fucking Matt was playing his stupid Witcher knockoff goof. Um, Meralt of Mivia. Uh, if I'm using my monster tracking ability, you know, I can add my plus one or plus two, whatever it was. Uh, I think it was plus one for that one. And then, you know, okay. And then I say, okay, cool. Roll your uh, fucking uh, instinct. And Matt goes, oh, well, my instincts is zero, so I'm rolling at a plus one. And then our ranger player goes, oh, well, my instincts a plus three because like I or plus two because I use instinct more as a ranger. So like I already had that higher. So I just have a better bonus, even though you have an experience for it. That feels a little wonky. Yeah, like your experience is kind of irrelevant then and like not irrelevant because like it could still matter, but it's definitely feels sort of like less valuable. But also, I don't necessarily know how to fix that problem. There's a part of me that almost wants to say a way you could do experiences is instead of adding a bonus to the role, your role just becomes whatever the experience bonus is. So like you would have to make the bonuses for experiences higher to, to make this worth it. But like, for example, imagine if you started with experiences at plus four and plus three, you go, I'm a monster hunter. OK. And the player goes, I would like to like follow these tracks. And the GM says, OK, make me an instinct roll. And the player goes, can I use my monster hunter experience since that's at a plus four instead? And that's what I'm doing. OK, cool. So instead of rolling a plus three, you roll a plus four, like it replaces the character trait bonus. Maybe that would I could see that I wouldn't mind that make that work better because um, it does feel a little weird to be like, I have an experience for this. And then another player is like, I'm just naturally better at this than you. <laughs> So it doesn't mm. matter. But then again, I guess D&D &D does have this problem too, right? Like you can take proficiency in something that you have a really bad stat for and then the player with the better stat just outpaces you anyway. So. Well, I mean, that's we that's what me and Matt said the other day, right? About like, it's really dumb that an arcane trickster 
with expertise and arcana is almost always going to roll better than a wizard yeah who only can only get proficiency on arcana and has done that thing more than the rogue I was kind of I, I was thinking about it the other way around but yes that too I was saying you could have like the wizard with plus four uh, intelligence make an arcana roll or you could have the cleric who took proficiency in arcana but they have a minus one to intelligence so with proficiency they only have a plus one but the wizard just has a better stat but didn't take proficiency so that but they just roll better at it anyway because they're at their attributes just higher you know what i mean that's what i was talking about but it goes both ways technically yeah so yeah i don't know i don't know how to fix that but that was the thing i noticed i don't know if there is a fix there might not be a fix for it tbh yeah i, I genuinely don't think there is like there i, I think some be. of these things they're just so ingrained that they just it's it sort of it either might, do or don't do yeah like, it's just sort of it might just be kind of a fantasy tabletop thing i mean again it doesn't make it totally like just because matt only had a plus one via monster hunter like it doesn't make him having that experience totally useless because he's if his character's in a scenario where the ranger character's not around or something he could still use it so you know it's not totally and also you know if you're not trying to power game the shit out of the game which in the case of daggerheart you shouldn't because it's really not in the spirit of the game to like try and power game the fuck out of it um you know, you could just be like, well, my character's technically worse at this, but it just makes more fictional sense for my character to be doing this right now. So fuck it. You know, like it's still relevant for those situations. So, you know, yep. I, I, I don't know, six in one, half a dozen in the other. If I can, it just, it just be that way sometimes, I guess. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to get on to Big Bertha one and Big Bertha two. You, you ready? Right. Is your are your loins girded on this one? As much as they can be. All right, let's talk about this wound threshold system. I don't like it. Let's get uh, okay. Hold on. Oh, gee, easy, easy, easy. Fucking shooting from the hip over here. So, I just want to say, as a GM, the wound system is kind of not a big deal on on the GM side of the table because for me, uh, adversaries just sort of engage with the system less. Because, A, some of them don't have a severe threshold at all. Like, some adversaries only have a minor and a major. So there's that. And then a lot of the values of the thresholds are quite a bit smaller on enemies. Like, the numbers are closer together. Like, I think a skeleton warrior has a major of four and a severe of eight. Right? So those values are closer together and just generally smaller. So the math is kind of easier. And... Uh, adversaries don't have armor at all. They cannot spend armor in any way to reduce the damage. So whatever damage they take is the damage they take. So for me on the GM side, you know, it's still a mechanic I have to pay attention to, but quite a bit less. And so it didn't really end up bothering me very much on the player side. However, <laughs> where, um, where are you at on that? <laughs> well, considering that it, you know we were playing the, the combat we were doing was 1.3 or 1.2 um well no it was mostly 1.3 actually we only did one session of 1.2 uh, well i mean with that in mind um yeah you just kind of get smacked like it's kind of strange it's like oh yeah use this i'll use your armor which is a limited resource to reduce damage but just based on how the numbers are working out I took, for on average, more severe level threats, uh, more, more severe level wounds than anything else. Like, I took a few high, but I took quite a few severe, which meant my armor's gone in two rounds, and then you're just eating damage of which you don't have a lot of, you know? It just felt kind of... Haphazard isn't the right word, but like, It just felt like you're not supposed to fight, if that makes sense. I mean, I don't know about not supposed to fight. You're definitely supposed to, I think, fight probably less often than you might be expected to in D&D &D or something like that, for sure. Um, well, th that's for sure. But like, 
it, for me, like that, you know, one of the longer combats we had, I think lasted like three or four rounds. And I was out of arm was I had I had burned five of my whatever, how many armor slots I had Six. one armor slot left after two rounds of combat. Yeah. And I was just like, what the fuck is this? What is happening right now? Uh, yeah, I mean, I th- I think. Yeah, I don't know. Like you can't. The thing is, like you can regenerate armor on short rest, which is a factor to consider. Um, but yes, it did seem like you guys burned through the armor pretty fast. But I mean, if if that's your only complaint about it, then honestly, that's kind of an easy fix. That just requires some number tweaking, you know, higher armor values or higher wound thresholds or maybe more HP or like that. If if the problem is just you felt like you got smacked too fast and too hard, that that can be fixed fairly easily in terms of just moving numbers around. You know what I mean? Or maybe even just yeah, a, it, decreasing monster damage. Like, you know, there's lots of ways you could sort of mess with that. Uh, um, and I mean, I, I, I would need experience as a GM with this game to say for sure. But I do find it kind of weird that, you know, let's say a, a severe threshold, right? Like, let's say for a monster, it's 15 points. Yeah. Uh, by taking one level... For my per my per, and and boosting my proficiency, yeah. One, so I'm doing two d eight yes. plus one d six, yeah. And then if I burn two hope, I was doing twenty five plus damage, yep. Which felt kind of weird. Like it, it felt like the game was actively trying to dissuade you from smacking something as hard as you can, or like like I don't know. I feel like f- uh, Rogue is the perfect class to be like, "Fuck it, I'm just gonna burn all my hope on this one shot and one and and literally one shot something." Right? I'm gonna do the the Fire Emblem Silencer sure shot kill ability. Uh, except you literally you can't can. do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you can't. literally can't yeah. because it will max out at three damage. Yeah. So you're like, oh, so I, I just I just blew my entire load, and now I have nothing, and I'm gonna get smacked because the dragon yeah, just refuses. You know what well, I mean? You, like, well, what? you don't. Yeah, you don't want to blow your entire load. You want to blow enough load that you feel like you can get a full three damage, but you don't want to blow so much load that you're like wasting hope on extra damage for no reason. Yeah, it's yeah. There's like a happy medium there. Um. Yeah, I mean, I didn't think about. I don't have to think about that on the GM side because the monster damage is just is what it is. They don't tend to have a lot of ways to like adjust their own damage and shit. So hmm. not really a concern. Um, well, I think I it think does... it matters more for Rogue because they are really squishy. So they have to end things as quickly as possible. It, well, yeah. because you can only do three damage, you are actively limiting how fast they can end things, which means yes. at some point, especially, you know, we're going to talk about this later. With the action tracker, you're going to get smacked. I think, well, I think part of the limiting, I mean, s- s- side note, you're, <laughs> I think you're overshooting your squishiness a little bit because the wizard uh, still exists, but <laughs> um, the, uh, I think the intention, basically, I think they're trying to avoid the, I just one shot the boss situations, I think is, is what they're trying to get around so by making it so that the the um you know the most damage you can ever do is three and if a boss has like six health then you know as a gm it's going to survive bare minimum to like sort of two two round not even two attacks really the funny thing is though you still could just one shot the boss before it does anything because one rogue player attacks and then the the warrior player attacks and then you both do enough damage to both do three damage and then it dies anyway so actually that's not even sure it's not even necessarily doing it's not a, it's not guaranteeing the monster gets to act it makes it a lot more likely that the monster gets to act obviously but it's not guaranteeing it yeah uh, it it just yeah it feels weird there i i just I just still don't understand what it's for. I just don't get what the point of the wound threshold system is. Because... Well, so, like, I I get it for players. I totally do. I don't. Well, because you're... For the most part, you're still going to have... Like, unless you actively put points into your health, you don't gain any extra health on a level unless you choose to do that, which takes away from something else. Right. 
So being like, oh, the wizard who can only take three points of damage total, if the wizard never wants to up their health, and that means even at end game, they're not just going to get one shot whacked and then they're done. You know what I mean? That oh, makes sense at, to me. At the bare minimum, they'd have to get hit twice. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's true. That's true. But, you know, I don't I don't know. I don't see any reason why health in this game couldn't just work like 5e, honestly. Like, not to... As much as I'm, you know, a uh, 5e can go fuck itself guy. Like... I don't see any reason why you can't just have a health number that goes up at a fairly consistent basis. You know what I mean? Like that seems fine. And it seems like they're trying to reinvent the wheel. And I'm not really seeing what the point of reinventing the wheel is here. You know, because it seems like uh, more I mean, headache than it's worth. Like the juice ain't worth uh, the squeeze. Well, for me, I feel like it's number creep. Like, and you are getting number creep. You're not you like no matter what. You're going to get number creep, especially if we're talking about what I'm talking about, which is uncap enemies and keep the cap on players or vice versa. Sorry. Right. Um, right. You're, you're reducing that on the player side, right? A player doesn't have to go, oh, well, I have 200 HP, but the dragon's breath is 75 HP, which brings me down to like, you're like, oh, OK, it hit me as hard as it can. I'm now I've taken three wounds or three HP. I'm at half health. I know that. Sure. And that feels good thematically, right? It's a dragon. It doesn't really matter how hard or light it whacks you. It's 80 feet tall. If it flicks you, you're going to take three wounds. You know what I mean? Is the number creep that bad, though, in 5e? You know, like... At later levels, yes. It is that bad. I don't feel like I it love is. being a DPS. But me looking at you as the dungeon master and being like, okay, so I hit you twice? Okay, so that's... 2d8 plus uh, two attacks, so that's another 68. Uh, and then I'm going to have this thing that does another. It, the numbers just keep adding. And then you but, like. But is the problem there the, the size of the numbers? Or is the problem just that you have 800 different things that's all affecting the final value? You know what I mean? Like, I don't think the size think of go the into number. It for sure. Huh? Both go into it for sure. I guess I don't feel like the I don't feel like the the overall size of the number is necessarily the problem there. You know, like every time Sam took a turn in our 5e campaign, the reason I got annoyed wasn't the fact that Sam was doing a big number. The reason I got annoyed is because Sam had to calculate his damage from five different sources. He had sneak attack, divine smite, the base weapon damage, the magical bonus damage from the weapon itself, and then the improved divine smite damage. And he had to add those all together. The problem was that he had, had to add five damage numbers together. If it was just he rolled two dice and then got a big number that then I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have bothered me. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? I guess like it's, it's the adding stuff for together from a bunch of different places. I think that causes the clunkiness more so than the damage being big itself. And you still like, if that's the problem dagger hearts trying to avoid, I don't even know if it's really avoiding that, you know? Because you're no, still it's, rolling, it's just sort of changing it for something else. That's that's true. Yeah, because you're still rolling um, a bunch of damage dice and adding them together to get a number, and then comparing a number to a chart. So why do we need the chart? Can we not just skip the chart and just subtract like we do in five? You know what I mean? Because you're still because the number, the damage numbers in Daggerheart are still going to get pretty big. Because if you have a player care, if you have a player who levels up their proficiency every single level, they're going to be rolling six six damage dice from their weapon and adding that all together and then attacking that's no different than in 5e really you're still adding a bunch of dice together and then getting a big number the difference is in dagger heart i'm comparing the big number to this chart i have i don't feel like it's if it's trying to avoid that problem i don't feel like it's avoiding that problem if that's the objective i don't even know if that is the objective well but if I, don't know, it is. I, I think you're avoiding it a little bit, right? Because it's like, if you know your major threshold is 15. Oh, because you, take, you, you can take 80 damage. You go, okay, right. so I took three it's, HP. I took three. Yeah, that's true. If you see the number go big enough, you know, just you don't have to math it out. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You might have an argument there. There's something there. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I, 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 I want to just throw it out. That's where I'm at. 
I, I don't want to throw it out, but I uh, it, I think it really needs some iteration. Uh, like, like a lot of my complaints. I don't, it might seem like I have a lot of them. I don't actually. It's just the things that I am complaining about, I think need a lot of iteration. Yeah. And or complete reworks, and I don't think that's going to happen. I, for, for me, I look at the wound threshold thing, and I think, throw it out. Just have a normal sort of health cur- curve like you would in 5e and then the armor system just keep as is and subtracts from the incoming damage like it would in something like Star Wars. That's what I would say. That's where I'm at. Hmm. But the argument you, the argument you're making of eventually you get to know your chart and you just know if you see a certain number above a certain amount then oh I took 3 damage. There is a little bit of an argument there. Yeah, that's probably true. Although your thresholds can change throughout the campaign, but I guess they don't change that often, so it's not a huge deal. Maybe. Maybe the solution is throw out the thresholds completely on the GM side and just leave them for the players. That's what I was just saying. (laughs) I know. And I wasn't totally agreeing with it, but now that I'm thinking about it, maybe that is the move. I didn't agree with you initially, but maybe maybe you maybe you're right. Yeah, like maybe that is because yeah, cuz the GM doesn't get cuz the thing about the on the GM side is I have to constantly check the chart because every monster, you know, every adversary has a different wound threshold chart, so I can't I don't have the luxury of memorizing the way a player does. So yeah. Yeah, maybe that is what it is. Maybe just monsters should just have big health pools and players have the threshold system. Because I'd be okay with that because the game already has differences between adversaries and PCs and the way they work, which I like. That's a good thing. I don't like. I want a game to have the two sides of the table play differently because the needs, the needs of the GM and the needs of a player are different. So I want to keep that. So, yeah, if the if the HP work differently, because here's the thing, monsters already attack differently. They have different bonuses when they attack. They don't have stats like players. Their moves don't work the same. You know, they spend actions. The players don't like basically monsters don't do anything the same as player characters with the exception of the wound thresholds and stamina stress. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And stress. So. Yeah. Right. Because like, do they do anything else? Yeah, no. Yeah. Like they don't even have like an evasion stat. They have a number called difficulty and their difficulty number is it's their evasion. But it's also like if you're trying to sneak around a guard, the difficulty number also acts as their like their perception. Essentially, the difficulty number, if you're trying to like break a grapple, it tre- it's basically just a catch all bonus number. It's just a catch all number for the adversary that the player has to beat to overcome that adversary. So, like, they don't mm-hmm. even have evasions or DCs of any kind. <laughs> or they have one DC that covers everything. So, yeah. Yeah, fu- yeah, ma- yeah. Throw the wound. Th- yeah, throw the wound system out for monsters or for adversaries. Calling them monsters for adversaries. Get that crap out of here. <laughs> yes. I still don't know Sorry. if I like it. For- I still don't know if I like it for players. I'm in debate on that, but. You're you're slowly convincing me the other direction, ever so slowly. Fair enough. Okay, progress. Next one, however, I please God, just throw it out. I can't. I can't. The action tracker. Yeah, I, like it. I can't. I can't with the action. Like just it. get rid of it. I really. I need to. Okay, I need to explain this. I need to give the full birth of this. Right. So we we did our it, it, for those who listened to the episodes. We did our we did we did a pretty good deep dis, deep dive discussion on the action tracker because I am someone who has played my favorite tabletop system is Apocalypse World. I also am a big fan of Dungeon World. I have played a whole bunch of those two games. I am also a big fan of Blades in the Dark. Those three games Daggerheart is taking from heavily in terms of inspiration like in terms of mechanics and design and all the shit the the designer himself mr a good sir mr spencer stark has just admitted yes i like these games i'm pulling from them 
So those games all do not have an initiative system in like they have no initiative in them and they work great and they have a great system for how to deal with that fact that there is no initiative and the fact that the GM does not roll. Daggerheart very easily could have taken that system, but they did not. Instead, they have the action tracker system and monsters make attack rolls. The only time the GM rolls in Daggerheart is when a monster is attacking. This is fucking annoying. I did not enjoy making attack rolls. And that may sound insane to someone who's only GM D&D, but it was actively annoying because I had to go from sitting there narrating, running the fiction of the game, keeping the flow and the pace, and then, oh, sorry, now I have to make an attack roll. I can't just say the monster attacks. I have to make a roll. It was actively annoying. I, and I know that, that that probably didn't come through when we're playing, but like, yeah. <laughs> no, the, 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 so that I, I could I could tell you were getting frustrated. The thing with me, right, is I actually not complaints. what you think. So I don't like that the player just has carte blanche to do infinite actions. Because that's right. That's the that's the that's what we, we've been talking about, right? Like restraints breed creativity. If I can. Oh, so I can attack and then hide and then run and then turn invisible and then teleport and I'll just be gone. It's like, well, yeah, but then the DM can do like five things. And it's like, so I'm gone. Well, yeah, you're gone, but the DM can still do five things. And it's like, eh. I'm okay with the GM or with the players being able to do as many actions as they want. Because again, like in Blades or Apocalypse World, you can keep doing stuff over and over and over again until you fail your role or you get a partial success. And then the GM gets to respond. Because in those games, it's the same situation. If you're playing Blades and you're rolling immaculately, the GM can basically can't stop you. And it's the same deal in Apocalypse World. If you're rolling immaculately, the GM can't stop you. But as soon as you get that partial success, the GM gets to step in. And just statistically, it's going to happen eventually. Like, you're going to roll good. You can have a good streak, but like, it's not going to last forever. So I'm okay with that. I don't think that's necessarily an issue. I think the reason it maybe feels a little bit weird in Daggerheart is just because Daggerheart is sort of kind of trying to be a little bit between D&D and Dungeon World or D&D and Apollo's World. So the idea like the f- I guess what I'm saying is the fiction is a little bit different, right? Because in Blades in the Dark you're playing criminals on a heist. So the idea of, if you think about it like a movie, we're focusing on this one character for an extended period of time while he does his thing X, Y, and Z. And then we're going to shift over to this other character for an extended period of time while he does his thing, part of the heist. That makes sense in that style of fiction. So in Blades, all right, we're focusing on this guy is talking to the guards and convincing them and distracting them to do X, Y, and Z. And then our thief guy is going to break into the window. So first we'll focus on the guard dude, and then we'll shift over to what the thief guy is doing. And that sort of feels right. And then in Apocalypse World, it's not a fantasy adventure game. So fights are not as frequent. The pace is not the same. You're not going around like... In Apocalypse World, it's not we're running around as a party fighting monsters. That's basically never how that game goes. So, again, feels a little not that weird. Daggerheart is we're a party of adventurers fighting monsters. So I think it just feels a little bit weird to try and bounce that ball around. But I'm kind of okay with it because, again, that's just a thing that a GM can handle like I as a GM can just go okay we're gonna focus on you and then we'll bounce back to you and then we'll like I'm okay with the player just doing you know if they especially if what the player is doing is interesting I'm okay with focusing on what the player is doing you know when you were doing the whole like I'm gonna fly you know when your character you're like I'm gonna fly away from the flicker fly that was a sentence (laughs) I'm gonna fly away from the flicker fly and like bob and weave between the trees and then attack you know that is like fictionally an interesting thing that's going on so I'm okay focusing on it for a little while you know what I mean like it's not I don't think that's very disruptive no but I think you could have accomplished I think I could have accomplished the same thing with action points right you could have maybe but honestly I don't the action tracker I don't think the problem you're talking about is not tied to the action tracker it's it's more about the idea of the game not having a a standard initiative system. You know what I mean? 
Like, the tracker itself is not an issue there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, no, I mean, it's it's not just the initiative. It's the, like, for the first couple sessions, I didn't know how many things I can do. To be fair, and I didn't, I didn't per, like, fully grasp the initiative track. Like, I read it, and it, it just was really wonky, and then I reread it. And it right. still was wonky. Because, because you don't interact with it. The initiative tracker is not for the players. It it has nothing to do with the players. That's the thing. It's only it, for well, the GM. It, it does it on the face of it. No, it, it, no, it doesn't it, at all. Because well, you it, it does insofar as the things I do cause shifts in the initiative tracker. They don't. What you they do, do because whenever whenever I do an action, it puts another track another action on me, the action yes, tracker. It, it gives the GM ammo, but. You don't need to. You don't interact with the action tracker at all. Like you like you can't do anything with those tokens. Only I as the GM can do anything with those tokens. So you can just keep doing whatever you want. As long as the GM says that you can keep doing whatever you want. You don't actually have to worry about it. You don't you could completely ignore it. You know what I mean? I could, but it, it would be and this isn't even a metagame thing. It would just be unwise to ignore it. Because if I do a billion things, that's going to put a billion actions on the tracker for the DM. But if anyone does anything, it's going to put like if anyone does literally any action. Th- you doing a billion things is not a big deal because everyone's going to be doing stuff and everyone doing stuff puts points on the tracker. That has nothing to do with anything. If you were playing Dungeon World, you could also just do a billion things and the consequences are going to be exactly the same. You keep doing stuff until something bad happens and then the GM can respond to all the stuff you just did. You know what I mean? Like, it's the same... It's the same thing. It's just... I don't know. I mean, does it look a little more threatening, maybe, because the GM keeps adding ammo to the thing? I That that might be, you know, an argument. Granted, well, it's a little I, different insofar as in, in, right, in Apocalypse World. I can do kind of infinite things. Yes. But those things are almost almost always going to affect me right i what i put in i am getting out on me right if i attack the dragon the dragon's not going to attack um you know meryl to mivia i attack the dragon the dragon's going to attack me oh because the dragon the is responding to your role yeah. oh because technically what oh so what you're saying is in in daggerheart technically you could do a bunch of actions and then you could get a success with fear. And then I, as the GM go, all right, it, I'm going to now activate the flicker fly. Uh, the flicker fly is going to attack Meralt and not attack EO because I feel like it. And yeah, and, and, a- and I'm not doing that to like, to put the, oh, not to be like, Oh, the DM is trying to fuck you. Cause that's not even what it is. It's just, I have done something Right. It makes more sense that me, who's completely isolated, would be affected less when you have ten skeletons over here. Right? That's right. that's not right. What you're saying being is a bad GM. That's just playing the game like, you know, with a modicum of intelligence. You know? Yes. Well, yeah. So the GM could spend those tokens. Basically you're yeah, so what you're saying is the reprisal is not necessarily directly tied to the person doing the action because the GM could hypothetically spend those action tokens to attack somebody else who didn't actually do anything yet. Yes. That is true. And yeah, I guess the only sort of argument I can say there is you should follow the fiction and not necessarily like, because, yes, you could do a thing where, oh, EO, you know, your character EO has attacked the flicker fly three times and now finally you fail to roll. So now the GM, you know, I as the GM go, all right, I'm activating the flicker fly. I am now going to attack Matt's character three times. Fictionally, that doesn't really make any sense because you just attacked the flicker fly. It would make the most sense that the creature attack the thing that just attacked it rather than going after somebody else. And that would feel shitty. So, yeah, the idea, I think, is supposed to be that you should follow the fiction. But you are kind of correct that, yes, your actions could screw somebody else over, not just you. Whereas, yeah, in Dungeon World, it would be it would be directly in response to your immediate thing. Hmm. I hadn't necessarily thought of it in that fashion. That is, I mean. 
That is kind of an issue in D&D also. But... How do you figure? Well, because, like, you could do the same thing, right? If you imagine, all right, the rogue player attacks the dragon a whole bunch and does a shitload of damage on his turn on the sneak attack and then the dragon's turn comes around and the dragon's like i understand that that rogue just stabbed me for a lot of damage i'm gonna kill the wizard instead you know like D that can still be an issue i guess the difference is you're not necessarily giving ammo to the enemy right yeah yeah huh this is, yeah, okay. You've now pointed out a new problem I have with the Action Tracker that I didn't even consider before. <laughs> this seems to be happening a lot today. <laughs> I now hate the Action Tracker further than I was already annoyed about it. All right, we're going we're gonna to put a pin on that one because I need to explain... I need to explain what my, my main beef with it. Now I have that beef, so we'll add that one to the list. To the Book of Grudges, if you will. So I'm just going to read what I wrote verbatim here because I just need to because I teased it out when I was writing it. Okay, this self, this system for me, which is saying the action tracker system felt actively detrimental, not annoying, not it didn't feel fun, literally detrimental to me running the game. The presence of the tracker kept my mind in a much more D&D combat, quote unquote, D&D combat style, where I was too busy considering resources slash ammo to spend and make things happen with. And as such, I spent less time thinking about the fight in like a fiction or narrative focused way. In a game like Dungeon World, I feel like I'm able to fake make the fiction more interesting and free flowing because I don't have to track mechanic specific stuff like ammo, turns, ability timer, ability resources, etc. I feel like this tug of war between the two styles of game in my head made it harder to run and make combat interesting. So my problem was literally that to, to sort of summarize that whole thing I just said. The action tracker puts my brain in D&D mode, but the game tells me I should be running in Dungeon World mode. But I didn't feel like I could. I didn't feel like I could do the free-flowing style of combat that you have in Dungeon World because I had to look at my action tracker and go, okay... How many points do I have? Can I spend those points on X, Y, or Z ability? How many attacks can this monster make? Okay, this creature has Relentless, so it can attack three times. So I'm going to spend three action tokens for this. Also, I have a point of fear that I'm going to spend on this ability. Oh, I have six fear banked up. Okay, I'm going to spend a bunch of fear to summon a monster, interrupt you guys as players, and give myself an action token to then attack. Like, I have to do all this math. Basically, I'm constantly looking at my ammo count on the screen or on the table, you know, the screen in the, in our case playing virtually. I'm constantly looking at my ammo count to make sure that I can do all the cool stuff I want to do as opposed to something like Dungeon World where if the player goes, "All right, I attack the monster and then gets a partial success," I can just say, "Cool, the monster in response does this." And I don't need to like Look at how many points I have or my fear or my this or my th I just go the monster does this thing and does this much damage or whatever. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it literally made like I was trying to run fights like Dungeon World because that's what I wanted to do, but it literally made it difficult to do so because the action tracker feels like this thing I have to worry about. And I should point out. This is not inherently a problem, right? When I'm playing, when I'm running D&D, &D, you know, I just finished running a three year long D&D &D 5e campaign. The initiative, the initiative tracker doesn't bother me in 5e because 5e plays, you know, in terms of its combat, plays like a sort of tactical board game. That's the point. And so that's the mindset I'm in. I don't sit down and play D&D &D and expect it to work like Blades in the Dark because it that's not the point. So it doesn't bother me. Daggerheart tells me this should work like Blades in the Dark. But when I'm trying to run a combat, it doesn't feel like that's what it is. 
it feels like I'm being tugged back and forth between D and D brain and, and dungeon world brain and D and D brain and dungeon world. Like I'm going back and forth and back and forth. And it's just got really frustrating. <laughs> like actively uh, like detrimental to the enjoyment. Yeah. I could feel that being annoying as shit after a while. Yeah. Like I didn't know which it was like, I didn't know what style of play I wanted to, you know, it'd be like if you're watching a movie and like, one second the movie is fucking you know i don't know what's a what's a dumb action movie i could use is like one movie (laughs) i like that we both had the same thought there one minute the movie is fast and the furious and then the next scene the movie's like the irishman and you're like all right well these are who this is not the vibe i signed up for this is drastically different you know like or one yeah. minute I'm watching Dune and then all of a sudden Paul Atreides goes Super Saiyan backflips and throws me only at Thanos. And I'm like, that's not what happened to the I thought we were talking about the Atreides house betrayal. I don't what's Paul's. Why does Paul have me on there? <laughs> like he what just, a wild shift that would have been in Dune part two. Right. <laughs> so, Actually fucking unhinged. <laughs> so it's like. The game is like, you should run it like Dungeon World. And I'm like, okay. And then I go, I kind of can't because this action tracker is taking so much of my mental bandwidth. I'm so focused on it that I'm like, no, I can't. And that just just kind of sucked. Uh, I I will give, you know, to give the game a little credit, there was a... The, what, <laughs> Actually, this might not be giving the game credit so much as this is giving credit to me and you as player and GM, to be honest. But there was a particular moment of brilliance where I was like, oh, this is what the combat should feel like, which is when you were your character was flying away from the flicker fly enemy that was chasing him. And you were sort of bobbing and weaving from the trees and then hiding and and then jumping and attacking it. Right. That Mm. felt really fun, and that felt like what I think the combat is supposed to feel like. But in order for that to work, I had to really, really consciously focus on the fiction of that scene and make sure I was paying attention and following the fiction in a way that felt good. I wasn't just doing it naturally. I had to, like, I almost sort of started ignoring the action tracker and focused on the fiction more specifically. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I actively shifted my brain to get that scene to work because what you were because what you were doing as a player was cool and interesting. So I was like, okay, I want to focus on that because it's cool and interesting and I don't want to like shut the cool fun idea down. So to make that work, I'm going to have to just ignore this mechanical bit to really for it to feel good. Yeah. And for what it's worth, I also was like, th- that was the first time when we were playing that I was like, oh, this is like what it should feel like super interesting. Yeah. yeah. Like, So, yeah, that's the whole thing, right? Is like, oh, this is where this is the game's systems kind of working the way they should. So, uh, yeah, all this to say is, um, man, just just no throw the action tracker out just get rid of it gone ixnay that bitch i don't want it i don't want it i don't want the action tracker and i don't want to have to make attack rolls as the gm toss it i don't want either of them (laughs) like it's just i say toss one but leave the other which one are you leaving i i like thresholds but action tracker yeah that's not what I said. I said attack. I said I said I don't want to make attack rolls. Oh yeah, my bad, my bad. I, I my brain auto corrected on that one. Yeah, no, I don't want to have to make attack rolls with monsters mm. because it feels weird that ninety percent of the game, like most of the time, I'm not rolling, and then every once in a while, now I'm making rolls. You know, and it's just weird that some t- most of the time I'm not, and then now I am. I would just prefer to either roll all the time or not roll at all. Like, you know what I mean? Hmm. I don't like that in between. That feels weird. But yeah, man, the action tracker. Uh, it just it's just, you know, they tried it. They tried a cool idea. They were trying out. they were given something a little twirl. And, um, you know, we tried, but no, no. Yeah, it just sort of ain't it, chief. It just ain't it. It just ain't it. I mean, I don't know how it feels on the player side. I mean, you guys interact with it so, so little that. 
probably don't even have a particularly strong opinion about it, but yeah. No, I mean, like I said, outside of what I had said about it earlier, right. no, pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So, eh. Um, some other little things. Again, I did not jot these down in a sensible order. I probably should have. Um, I really want connections connections on the character sheet. I just want those to do something mechanically. Yeah. They're fun. Que- they're like fun little prompts. They're fun questions. I want them to do something. Um, yeah, they just sort of exist. Like, they're, yeah, they exist they're just for fictional. the purpose of the GM having ammo to use in backstory stuff. Right, yeah. Like, they're they're you know, bringing up the, the rhinoceros beetle. That's like right. one of those things, but it doesn't really do anything beside that. I mean, and I feel like it should. I, it literally doesn't do anything beside that. Yeah, it feels like it. Like, particularly the background questions, I'm okay not necessarily doing something, but the connections, the ones that are like questions between players, I feel like those should do something. You know, for example, yeah. in Apocalypse Worlds, you know, take your, I don't know, fucking 80th shot at this point. Um, in Apocalypse World, you have history between player characters. And when a player care, when player characters go to help or hinder each other, your history affects that roll bonus. So like it does something because you know each other, you have a connection with each other. So like I can either make your life harder or easier because I know you. Uh, and then also if your history goes above or below a certain threshold, you can get XP for it. So like if you learn, if you get to know a character better or get to know a character worse because your history can go down with a character. It doesn't matter if you go minus four or plus four, it resets and you get XP. So, you know, it has like it's a it's a character fiction. You know, it's like a story building thing, but it also does something. I just want connections mm. to do so. I would kind of like con- I know the game doesn't have an XP system, but I feel like connections is a good place where you could make an XP system. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like how many times you, you manage to like <laughs> squeeze your connections in. Yeah, yeah. Like if you, Oh, but, but then you basically be getting the, the fucking the blades and apocalypse. Like you just get that. Yes. Which isn't a bad thing, but that yeah, I mean, is yes, what you'd end up with. that is what you end up with, but I don't think, I think that's fine. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, fair, I guess if you want to avoid just like taking directly from another system, maybe sure. Yeah. The other idea I had is connections could be a bonus between character. Like if I go to help you and we have a connection thing and it, and the connection is relevant to this role, I give you a bonus or something. You know, it could be that too. Hmm. I don't know. I just, that's kind of a side thing. It's not that important, but you know, um, domain cards and like domain abilities, uh, which we were quite positive on our first read through, still positive on those i don't get to play with those at all as a gm don't interact no, with yeah that they're system. cool i i just want more of them i yeah i, I just mean, want more i like, mean you're, you're gonna get more i'm sure no yeah you are but like level one you get two and for me I, for me it was kind of unique because again i didn't i didn't end up using one of them ever one of them. and yeah. i was just like yeah yeah you know true true Oh, I, I meant I think you're probably going to have more choices because, like, I'm sure they're making more domain cards as the game develops. Along. Oh, yeah. I, I, I just want more at level one, like two. Oh, starting with more. Yeah, Matthew, yeah. I can see well, that. Well, because like, you think about it when you're when you're. You know, I'm going to I'm going to equate level one. Dagger heart to level three D&D, right? Because you're you have to count the subclass in there. Sure. Your subclass usually has. One or two things, but the rogue get three things. Um, and to be fair, I know no one uses thieves can't. It, there is such an ability. There, it is so cool on paper. Yes, it just never gets used. Um, I know, but you do technically get three things. And I'm gonna just look up Nexus real quick. I should have pulled this up before I was gonna bring up my so, point. But well, fuck it. So rogue, if you're looking at what the rogue gets in terms of like subclass and foundation stuff, uh, you get sneak attack and hide. And then from your subclass, you get one more ability. So three. Yeah. 
Uh, if you uh, play a Nightwalker, you get the Shadow Stepper thing, which you use a lot. Um, and then if you play a Syndicate Rogue, uh, you get an ability where you arrive. When you arrive in a prominent town or environment, you know somebody that calls this place home. Give them a name. Note how you think they might be useful and choose one from the list below. So you have the kind of like, I know a guy type ability. Yeah. So at level one, I had Uncanny Disguise, which I didn't get a chance to use. We weren't really in a town long enough. I don't really blame the game for that. Like, I don't I don't count it in the same as Rain of Blade. Right. Um, it's just that EO is a fucking weirdo and doesn't <laughs> I don't need to be disguised. He wants to be a weirdo. Uh-huh. Um. I believe you started yeah. with Uncanny Disguise and Reign of Blades. Yeah. And then you got Shadow So neither of them I, I interacted with particularly. Yeah, those you didn't use. You did use your Rogue ability and your subclass ability and your Fairy abilities quite a bit. Yes, I did use Shadowbind once. Um, and it was awesome. So, yeah, I mean, that's fair. Yeah, maybe a couple of more domain cards at level one and also more options. I would personally want, maybe I would want this, I don't know. I, I don't know yet, 100%. But I would almost want more abilities than you can actually use in a day. Like, prepared caster that bitch. So that is what ends up happening at higher level, because you get more domain cards than you can hold on your sheet. You and do, that's yeah. where you have to start yeah. making a loadout. But yeah, maybe that should be earlier on, like earlier level-wise. I could see that. Yeah, I give you four of them, and then you, you can, can only use two. two. Yeah, I could see that. That might be a good idea. Seeing as how that system's already in there. Yeah. Um. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um. Final thoughts. Uh. Berries are fucking sick. They've got a lot of really cool flavor. You can do a lot with like sick bug people. Yeah. Um. Or literal fairies. I don't know. Bug people. Bug people. Sorry, I agree. Make, the bug people are cooler. No, I agree. I don't make the rules. I just enforce them lethal intent. Uh, yeah, yeah. Bug people are cooler than just standard fairies. Agreed. Um, and rogue is a lot of fun when you kind of figure out how to finagle it. Fair enough. Um, them together, even funnier. <laughs> we definitely had some interesting characters. Madara Uchiha voice. I mean, even though two of the characters were just fucking goofs, we still had the same two. character. <laughs> they were the same character goof twice, but it was still they were still fun nonetheless. So I think that's pretty that's pretty good like points towards I, the system. I just I, so I love that that so Sam's character was just Geralt. Yes, Matt's character was Geralt as a wizard. If he got thrown into a portal to Skyrim, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, it was. Just, we had Geralt twice, but the fact that we had Geralt twice and they both still felt kind of fun and like interesting, I think, is you know a good sign. Mm. Uh, but yes, we did have double Geralt. Um, all right, and can I just say I I didn't realize that Lita had a familiar until yeah, the, the fact that she session. had a ranger pet, yeah, 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 just had no idea she could do anything yeah, like yeah. that. She was like, oh yeah, I pull out my fox, and I was like, what yeah. the. F- uh, yeah, the, yes. The well, yeah, so the ranger from? gets a Beastmaster. Yeah, if you choose Beastmaster Ranger, you get a companion, um, you know, a la Beastmaster in 5e. Uh, but yeah, she just, just kind of didn't, it did, just didn't come up until a little bit later. And then, it, you know, that was like, surprise. Uh, yes, her, uh, our ranger, her pet was a Fennec Fox. I want you to know that I felt so gaslit to be like, wait. Did I just spend three sessions not hearing about this fucking fox or is she making this up? <laughs> no, no, no. She just it was just wasn't mentioned. It just didn't come up. Funny I, enough. I she, just, she also did hysterical, descri- dude. She also did describe it, which is kind of funny. Like she didn't mention that it was like around or on her shoulder or anything, which I don't know. That was kind of weird, but whatever. Um, it was more like two sessions, but yeah. Uh anyway. I was just sitting there like, you got me fucked up. <laughs> Isaiah's like, are they just fucking with me? Um, Dude, like, I swear to God, the, the first time I, I genuinely was like, is this a bit? No, I don't blame <laughs> you. I don't blame you. Um, lastly, adversaries. Uh, I just wanted to mention. So. He, I, I will admit it was it was quite difficult. Now, this is one of those things, obviously, that you get better at. Uh, if you play a game more, but um, it was pretty difficult for me to gauge how threatening adversaries were going to be. Like, I had a really hard time 
looking at an enemy and going, oh, this enemy will be strong and this enemy will be weak. I, I, I was wrong like half the time. <laughs> so I could see that. That's see that a little a frustrating, but that could just be me not, you know, knowing the system well enough. And maybe once I learn the system, it will be easier. Um, I did use the encounter building system, but I don't know if I can say if it works very well or not, because I sort of I didn't use it a ton. I used it like twice and I used it kind of wrong. <laughs> because so we had the one fight where it was uh, Kyoran and the three skeletons, right? Mm. The Rhino Beetle Kyoran, he was a Spellblade adversary, which is a leader type, and then the skeletons are standard enemies. So it was one leader and three standard enemies, which should be about a standard encounter according to the like encounter building system, where it says you should have an equal number of enemies to players uh, within the standard typing and then throw in maybe one special enemy and that'll be a standard encounter. I was like, okay, so that's what I did. The problem is that technically they were tier zero enemies and you guys were tier one. But I was like, well, they went from level one to level two. The jump shouldn't be that big. Bigger gap than I thought. <laughs> it was in fact that big. <laughs> it was in fact kind of that big so, for some reason. So the, the level two players just beat the dog shit out of those level tier zero guys. Um, then you guys fought the juvenile flicker fly, which was a tier one solo adversary, which as the name implies, you know, you can fight solo. Um, and then the minor chaos elemental that appeared in that fight was a tier zero solar and uh, solar solo adversary, solar solo adversary. So one one solo adversary of equal tier should be like a standard encounter. And then I threw in another adversary. So it was a slightly, you know, it was like roughly a little bit above, although it was a tier zero enemy, but still be a little bit above. But that felt that fight still felt a little too easy. So I don't know if the like encounter building system works 100 percent. Is kind of what I'm getting. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I did kind of solo the flicker fly. You kind of did. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Like You kind of 1v1 that shit. Now, granted, you were rolling pretty well, but still. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's one of those things, right, where you expect on some level, the, like the rolls to not. Right, like you could theoretically 1v1 a dragon in D&D if it just keeps not wanting. But right, 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 right. That's just not going to happen, realistically. Right, sure, yeah, yeah. The rolls are a factor, but not like they shouldn't outweigh it that much. But yeah, you you did sort of... I mean, it was a combination. You were rolling well, and you did kind of have like a legit, pretty solid strategy. So there's that. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, you did kind of 1v1 the solo monster, which you probably shouldn't have been able to, you know? Um, hmm. So that one's a little tricky. Uh... It, I think the problem is that there needs to be a little bit more granularity to the guidance. I think something it could mention is how many adversaries of tier X are equal to tier Y above. So like an example I gave was two tier zero standard adversaries are roughly equal to one tier one standard adversary, you know, something like that. Or four tier zero standard adversaries are equal to one tier two standard adversary. Like give a little more granularity on how those guys are supposed to break down. I think that would help. Um, and maybe give a little more of a guidance on that and maybe a little more guidance on like, if a monster does this much damage, you know, it should, it'll be this dangerous relative, you know, I don't know something along those lines. I think it just needs more granularity. I think they're in the right ballpark. Uh, there is a system that explains how to like adjust adversaries up or down tiers, uh, but I didn't really use that, so I can't can't comment a hundred percent. I use it a little bit, but not much. Uh, and then lastly, they added 
this is a really cool system. I I think I think this will let me rephrase. I think this will become an interesting system. They added a thing called environments, which are sort of environment stat blocks where the environment has special abilities and like a difficulty tied to it. Um, and the environments can be like you can use you can spend fear to like activate certain environment abilities. I think those will be cool. I didn't really get to use them as much as I wanted. Um, I did use them twice, but I don't even think you guys noticed. Uh, I mean, did you? I'm I assuming guess? one of them was for the. Um, oh, my God, my brain was the first one for the forest at night. Nope. No. OK, then I, that's the only one I was thinking. Uh, so I, the, the, the river with the bridge, the raging okay. river was one environment, but you guys just rolled really well. So I didn't get to use anything against you. I don't know if you noticed, but I put the action tracker on screen when you got to the river. Uh, I that did, was, yeah. that's why, because an environment adversary, you know, like turns on the action tracker basically. Um, and then the other one was the area that you fought the flicker fly, the like ancient grove area was also technically an environment and that was how so that one I did use a little bit because that was how I summoned the minor chaos elemental was from the environment ability gotcha so I did use it a little bit but again not a ton so it's kind of hard to say exactly but it's an intriguing system I like the idea of turning environments into their own stat blocks so they're kind of their own enemies I think that's pretty fun Mm -hmm. Um, no I agree I think to really get a good feel for it, I need to design like a whole kind of set piece around it to make it like a long extended thing that feels more impactful. Uh, But it's a cool idea. Yeah. That's the last thing I have notes wise. Any other things you're like, I need to complain about this or not complain or whatever. Honestly, no, I think I got it all out. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, so then my question to you becomes, on our usual one to scale, one to five scale, we've played the game, we've read it, do a little, we'll do a little review. On our one to five scale, what would you give it? Three. Three. Ooh. Solid three. Three? Like I said, the stuff that I really like about it, I really, really like. Right. The, like two or three things that I'm not vibing with, I really dislike. Just, just that, get that being resource usage, the thresholds, and, um... Oh, God. Brain. The, like, stats situation with class. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Um, yeah, stat layout. I'm gonna say I'm gonna give it a four out of five because I think right now the game right now looks the promise is quite strong and there's a lot of ideas where I'm like this will be I think super cool you just gotta iron out the kinks to make it really hit but I think when it does hit it she gonna hit you know what I'm saying yeah no I agree I think that's where I'm at it's got some really good shit in it. I did, there's a few aspects that I think need really serious retooling, and then yeah, we're good. Um, but oh, you know, yeah, a minor nitpick. Um, mm-hmm. They're probably gonna fix this later on, uh, and it comes with like the weapons and equipment. You still have situations where some stuff doesn't do anything, like the saber still does nothing. Yeah. Uh. That makes it just straight up less useful than something else. Even like if they do the same damage, but one has a passive ability like the rapier does. It's they both go off um, presence. They do the same damage, but the rapier gives you an extra attack for a stress. There's no reason to not go with it and just flavor it as a saber. Yeah, I mean, they're they're working on that. There is a whole bunch of equipment reworks with 1.4 just dropped today. So they're still looking at that a bunch. Uh, okay. But yeah, 
That's fair. Yeah, there's some wonkiness in the equipment to be sure. Uh, oh, speaking of equipment, guess what they added, Isaiah? Mm. They added a spear at Thanks tier zero. God. I now have a spear. <laughs> I was so confused by that, bro. <laughs> Such a weird omission. That definitely feels it's like just one, big stick. I, like, <laughs> I feel like that's one of those things that somebody just they just didn't realize they forgot and then nobody noticed. And then they went, oh, fuck, guys, we didn't put a spear in the game. <laughs> like, I don't feel like that was intentional. Somebody had to have just forgotten. You know what I mean? Yeah, because it's yeah, such a, you know, it's funny. I, I was talking to Paladin, uh, Paladin about this where he's like, I don't understand how, how people just miss things like that. And I was like, well, you have to think about it like. You spend so much time staring yeah, at staring something at it. Yeah. that you just pigeonhole into that one thing that you really like focused in on and everything yeah. else goes blind to you. Makes and then it, it genuinely takes totally someone else being like, it. there's no spear in here. And then you go, what? What do you mean? You no must have missed it. And then you scroll and you're like, what? you're like, ah, oh, fuck, there's no spear. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I get it. It makes perfect sense to me. Like, it's goofy, but I do understand how that kind of thing can happen. You know, it's like when it's like when you play a video game and the developers miss some really obvious little UI thing that would make your life so much easier. And they're like, how did nobody notice? It's like, well, they were busy designing 85 other things that you're, you know, had to deal with. Yeah, it's like Baldur's Gate, how you have to put people in your party to swap their gear. Oh, you don't have to do that anymore. They fixed that. Oh, did they? Nice, nice, yeah, nice. They fixed nice. that a little while ago. So, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, how did they not notice that was a problem? Well, they were too busy making sure your fucking parties part, you know, teammates functioned. Yeah. They were too busy winning awards. <laughs> that too, that too. Winning just just drowning in awards. They actually had to swim through trophies to get to their desks. So yeah. I, I was gonna make a joke about like and watch Larry and get fucking shut down in a week, but I was oh, like, please. oh wait, they're a private studio. They, they can't, can't get shut down. <laughs> like they have the power. Oh, rip high fire. I bro, I don't even want to. That means we just dated that, this video really hard. But we did just date care. this video, but that also means they're not going to get a hi-fi rush too, and that makes me unbelievably sad. Yeah, absolutely miffed. Even just <laughs> fucking done. Just hate everything. Worse than no DMC five. Anyway, that has been Daggerheart. We're into it. Game good, and hopefully, game yeah, will just game get good. better. You know, I mean, it goddamn better. I don't I mean, I suppose it could get horrendously worse, but I, I don't think it will. Yeah, could you imagine, though, fucking like several versions down the line? We're like, oh, this is terrible, man. What the fuck? Yeah, this just sucks, bro. <laughs> Biggest piece of dog shit. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> uh, if you like these mad ramblings, remember, follow or subscribe on whatever you're listening and on. If you'd like to keep up to date, follow us on the Twitter, even though it's burning to the ground. It's always burning. It's like perpetually on fire. It's just, at yeah, point. at this point, it's just a hellscape always on fire. Eternal hell flame. That's been us. Hey, hey. cat. I miss my cat. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate that one. I'm sorry. I'm (laughs) sorry.